Welcome. This is Watchman Privacy. I'm Gabriel Custodiate. If you like this listener-supported show and you want it to succeed and improve, please consider supporting it through one of the methods listed at watchmanprivacy.com. I have a privacy guide sold on Amazon, courses, and consulting. Free methods of supporting includes leaving positive reviews, subscribing to me wherever you can, Twitter, YouTube, Odyssey, etc., and sharing my work. Find links in the description or at watchmanprivacy.com. Your support determines the future of this show. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to the Watchman Privacy Podcast. I'm very pleased to be joined by the Silent Link admin today. And so what is Silent Link? Well, this is a, this is a phone service provider, okay, a mobile service provider, where you can get either a phone number or a data-only plan. So it's a, a foreign eSIM. Uh, from what I understand, which makes it more difficult, if not impossible in some cases, for your own country's telecom providers to get certain information about you. Um, that is, when you're traveling, right, you are roaming on a different network. So we're going we're gonna to discuss that. But uh, another thing about Silent Link, and the website is silent.link, is that you can pay for it without attaching your eSIM to your identity. So there's no KYC, not even an email when you sign up. And of course, I love services like that. So you can pay with Bitcoin, Lightning, Monero. Of course, we know on this show that it's a non-KYC Bitcoin or whirlpooled Bitcoin that is private. And in fact, you can only pay with these cryptocurrencies. If you do have a, a card, you could use something like Strike, which which will convert it to uh, to Bitcoin. But it's it's purely cryptocurrency based. That's interesting. I'm going to ask him about that. And it's an eSIM service. So there's no shipping. Uh, and it works worldwide. And many people use it just for that fact that you have that global convenience. There is no outbound phone calls or texts. So let me repeat that. You cannot actually make phone calls, legacy phone calls or legacy text messages. That's fine for me. I, I mostly use data anyway, but that's kind of just the summary of Silent Link. So Silent Link admin, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Hello, Gabriel. Thanks for inviting us. Phones are a, a great invention uh, that have made things a lot easier for us. Their main feature is to allow you to make legacy phone calls and SMS messages when you're traveling, when you're away from home. They also evolved to allow you to connect to the internet in whatever way you choose. So what we call data, they're, they're obviously very useful, but we know as privacy seekers that technology can be a double-edged uh, sword especially if we don't keep an eye on it, and especially in our current era of powerful governments. And I'm reminded of the Lord of the Rings, right? Gandalf's comments when he discovered Saruman using the Palantir, he says, they're not all accounted for the lost seeing stones. We do not know who else may be watching. And so he covers the stone, and when he touches it, it confirms the fact that the devil of this universe, Sauron, was in fact watching. So this is a bit like phones, right? Your phone service provider, who is providing you with this glorious, invisible, far-reaching service, is also in most cases, having access to the metadata and the actual data of your SMS messages and your legacy phone calls. And like your internet service provider, they can see basic things about your browsing history and app usage. Above all, they can detect your physical location of your phone through the triangulation of simply how cell towers work. This has been used in all kinds of ways against people, right? Your location can be enough to convict you of a crime, tie you to a protest, get you caught up in dragnet surveillance, your legacy SMS text messages can be used by machines called Stingrays, for example. We've, we've known about these where the government can set up particular machines that just soak up a lot of the uh, SMS messages and phone calls that are being made in a particular area, let's say during a protest. Um, and these can be sent to spy agencies. So there's a huge list of this stuff. I'm not going to keep going. So that's kind of my spiel at the beginning. Now, I know that things are a little bit different with Silentlink, but in the traditional model of phone service providers. I just wonder if you could explain to us a little bit about how how this works, right? If I'm a regular SMS user, a regular phone caller, right? I'm using data without a VPN. I'm not using privacy focused apps. And I just have a SIM card in my own country. What is my mobile service provider able to see about what I'm doing on my phone? Well, first of all, every cellular network knows your location quite precisely because they need uh, uh, they need to know your location to be able to route uh, calls and messages to your phone. So this is kind of unavoid unavoidable. Problem with traditional service is that you get all the services in one place. So if you happen to have an adversary, can be another person or a state or some organization, whatever. Uh, it's pretty trivial for this adversary to 
attack you by means of uh, uh, cellular service because they know where to go and uh, most often often uh, they know what to do whether they need to coerce some of uh, from the staff of this company or provide some legal papers or counterfeit these legal papers that depends on the adversary but uh, it's pretty obvious uh, how to approach this other uh, unpleasant things that uh, can be done through the cellular provider are for example what we call a sim toolkit attack uh, on our website actually this is not a very correct term because originally sim toolkit attack was uh, described by a group of european hackers as a way to exploit the sim toolkit functionality without knowing the sim key like i can make uh, the other person's uh, call some number or text some number cause a denial of service without knowing actually not call only a short message without knowing their key which is stored with the service provider in this case but in a broader sense if you happen to have uh, an adversary an adversary can try to extort this key or coerce the company that serves you to do this attack while they have this uh, access to your sim card and with most of mobile phones uh, actually not the phone controls the sim card whereas the uh, sim card controls the phone so they can do pretty nasty things uh, such as uh, eavesdropping uh, to the surroundings of the phone connecting to the ongoing calls uh, intercepting messages a lot of things I also just think of things like in the US there's a company Verizon and they sell like they sell location data. Uh, it's called Verizon Insights. And basically if you want to let's say market to Trump supporters, you can get data of the phone numbers that were at a Trump rally and you can market to these people. So there's all kinds of things you can do with location data and there's all kinds of uh, vulnerabilities that a phone has. Um, with or without a, a SIM card. And that location is just, uh, is, is huge. Let me ask you this, Silent Link admin. Can a phone provider typically see the text messages that the regular text messages that one is sending back and forth? And can they actually listen to a voice conversation that we're having, assuming it's over the default phone app and not using any kind of encrypted app? I guess you should consider this kind of uh, messages as public information. There's totally no defense against uh, eavesdropping. There, there, there is, of course, there is some encryption in the data channel over which the message is uh, transferred, but this encryption is old standard, it's broken, and there is definitely a backdoor, and the message is pro uh, processed and encrypted to the operator. So you can expect it and should expect it to leak. You've talked about a voice fingerprint. Could you explain what, what that means, a voice fingerprint? Uh, voice fingerprinting is a technology that allows to identify a talking person by sample of his or her voice. Pretty old technology and the equipment for voice fingerprinting was uh, sold to major cellular providers like uh, maybe 10 years ago. So. It would be safer to expect that fo uh, voice fingerprinting is deployed to most of the networks. If a phone provider is able to listen to a voice call, either live or recorded, let's say that somebody was following the burner theory of phones. So they go and they get a cheap burner phone, they pay for it in cash, and they're using the regular phone calling app to call someone. Well, if they're calling someone, and the phone provider is using a voice fingerprint, they have the ability, not necessarily that they're doing it on an ongoing basis, they have the ability to say, okay, this person did not attach their phone to their identity, but we see that this voice fingerprint matches this person, and now we have their location because they're using a phone just like everyone else. So that could completely wipe out the benefit of a burner phone. Does that sound right to you? We have all the reasons to believe that you have accurately described the actual situation. So what we've been talking about is kind of the, the vulnerabilities if you're using your local SIM card within your country. Now, you say on the Silent Link website that with anonymous eSIMs, 
your actual mobile number is not known to your local mobile network provider as you are in roaming. So you are providing us with these eSIM cards, which are from a, a different country. And that means we're always using roaming, which means that we're kind of loaning, we're, we're borrowing access to uh, a network, even when we're in our home country, because this eSIM is from a different country. So in that case, what can the provider in our home country, in that case, see if we're using a roaming eSIM? Do they not have access to that data we just described? Well, they see that uh, they have a visitor from another country. They can definitely intercept all the data. And uh, if you are not using a VPN or any other means of encrypting your data, you should consider this data to be open for analysis to the local carrier. Just just using a roaming is, uh, SIM is not an invisibility shield and does not protect you from uh, location tracking, but the local carrier doesn't know which uh, mobile phone and which SIM to track in the first place. The IMEI is a, my understanding is a hard-coded identifier within a particular phone. And that number exists regardless what service you're using, regardless of if you wipe your phone with Graphene OS or, or something like this, this is hard-coded into the phone. And therefore, if we want to sever ties with that identifier, which a phone provider can see and which Apple and Google can see, if we want to have privacy in, in that way, we would have to purchase a new phone. Does that accord with your understanding of an IMEI? Do we have to get a new phone in order to sever that tie? Sure, of course, unless you have a device that uh, can change uh, its IMEI. As far as I know, we don't know of any mobile phones that are IMEI changeable. There are some uh, mobile routers that allow you to change IMEI. And um, if uh, there are any persons uh, involved in manufacturing of mobile routers uh, or uh, making software for mobile routers or uh, just uh, some open WRT enthusiasts among your listeners, uh, please contact us. We will make a groundbreaking, absolutely fantastic product. What happens when someone dials the emergency number on their phone? How bad of a privacy event is that? Not bad at all, except uh, if you talk, you will get voice fingerprinted. Other than that, your phone uh, still transmits your IMEI. Uh, you do not need a SIM card to dial 911 or 112 in Europe. It's not a problem per se. Just if you were, let's say you had a you were using a phone without a SIM card just for regular stuff, and you accidentally made that call, w would that be a would that be a burned phone? Totally depends on your use case and uh, actually depends on who is your adversary. This is the most, impo the most important thing. If you are just protecting your private stuff from like your competitors or uh, neighbors, you can allow some things that uh, otherwise, if you are maybe uh, enemy of the state, you would not be able to allow. So you have to kind of uh, consider these trade-offs. Right, so be careful about pressing that emergency a phone call, which even works without a SIM card. I wanted to ask you Silent Link Admin, kind of a big picture question. Where did phones go wrong? Could could we have done it without all of this surveillance? The last privacy friendly option was uh, technology was paging, technically a broadcast, and there was no way to find out uh, where the recipient is. If you even remember what it was, right? Uh, for cellular communication, there is actually no way to make it private because the network needs to know where to route your call, where to find you in the network. With a changeable IMEI, of course, you can fight that, but you really need to be very careful and know what you are doing. And uh, changing IMEI is a criminal offense in many countries. Again, you need to know what you are doing because if some people just program their devices with zeros and they think it's a good idea when it's actually not, they're just signaling to the operator who serves them that they are going to do some nefarious stuff or just 
fooling around, but they definitely attracting at attention. And so for right now, we have to play within the rules, which is the way I do it. Is I just don't really make a phone part of my life. I just kind of have it and that option when I'm traveling uh, to take it out of the Faraday bag and and use it. Let's talk about Silent Link now and what what your company offers. So I understand you you guys are privacy focused, so you're not don't have a lot of a uh, public uh, or, or personal kind of information out there. But uh, let me just ask you this. What, what is the history of Silent Link and what are you willing to tell us about, I guess, your company and yourself just to give people a sense of who they're trusting with their phone service? There is almost no secret about that. We actually uh, worked in the business of selling travel SIM cards quite a while. I, I guess you know what's a travel SIM card. It's a SIM card that works in different countries and provides you with uh, decent roaming rates wherever you go. But then Bitcoin happened. Suddenly we were interested in uh, what can be done in this field. And then COVID hit and people stopped traveling and the pieces of the puzzle kind of fell into place. And we repackaged our service into a privacy first a service rather than a travel service. This is a very brief um, history of our company. Uh, we still have the fiat uh, facing legal company that is in uh, SIM travel business. We kind of try to not mix up these two things, keep them separate, but uh, this is the way it is. Yeah, fair enough. And there's no judgment, obviously, from me about wanting to, to keep things hidden and private obviously the the less you give out the more people make all kinds of assumptions right you know, you know you're a honey pot or, or things of the sort that's just bound to happen but let me just ask this like do you do you say at all where you guys are based no uh, actually there is uh, uh, why we are concealing this, this information we are kind of experimenting with this uh, bitcoin business we are trying to find the optimal rules how to behave in this environment and uh, at first we were going to disclose our company but then we understood it's not in the interest of our own users uh, we are not going to help their adversaries to compromise them or to try to compromise us to attack the, our users so uh, our customers do not need the legal information about our company and uh, they never require it. So if they uh, are interested, they can always do the background check on, on the number and uh, uh, eSIM data that they get from us. It's pretty easy to do. Believe me, I understand what you guys are doing, especially if you're just using only Bitcoin, you're using BTC Pay server. You don't have any banks you have to worry about. You could be anywhere in the world doing this uh, and providing the service. So that's a very interesting model. I'm glad that that's possible these days. That's that's pretty awesome. Does the ability to collect Bitcoin and Monero and Lightning in a sovereign way using BTC Pay Server, how freeing is that for you to be doing what you're doing, which is to offer a service, collect funds, have no bank tell you what you can or can't do? How freeing was that for you as a company? It's a miracle. I wonder why not everybody is doing it in all possible fields of business. It's just great. What can I say? Let's indulge some of the, the skeptics out there for a second. Let's say that Silent Link was a honeypot. What exactly could Silent Link do if it was malicious? Like, what's the, what's the worst it could do to a person? Well, if it were a honeypot, then uh, first of all, you would see a privacy policy on our website, I guess, because... Uh, it would not be possible to not put it there that would deter some of the uh, clients. We are happy to, to deter the, the clients that uh, are not right for us. That wouldn't be the case if we're, we were a honeypot. There would be probably be uh, some other legal information and there would be a lot of claims that uh, our service makes you totally invisible and untraceable. You will not find any such claims on our website. Our uh, proposition is very clear. We sell the service. We do not ask for personal data at all. We do not sell security. We do not sell privacy. We sell phone service without KYC information. That's it. If you were nefarious to our 
own users, which would be pretty unwise to us because we operate without any advertising at all. So our reputation is uh, all we have. In this case, we would... uh, I don't think that we would be able to do anything actually bad because the only information that we have on our users is uh, the time of the purchase and uh, the method of payment and uh, related information like was it bitcoin was it monero was it lightning what address was used we actually do not uh, have anything else at the moment we do not have or operate our own switch so we do not process the calls we do not have the data infrastructure. We also outsource it to a different company. So we cannot even intercept the data. So probably we would not be of much help to any legal justice, whatever. <laughs> right, yeah. Any any court order, if, if, if you were given a court order to give any information you have about X person, like assuming you still have that data, I'm not sure what your your retention policy is for for payments and such, but you could probably give them like say, hey, maybe this person paid with with this crypto, but as you said, you're you you are yourself selling eSIMs which you got from a different carrier, and there's not much of any information. And that's the great thing about not collecting information is that you don't really have anything to give. We're trying to avoid uh, any information that we do not need. We encourage our users to uh, use any anonymizing technologies when accessing our website. We will never use Cloudflare. We will never block Tor or anything. Please use whatever is available to you to conceal your IP address from us. We do not need this information. We do not want this information. We will help you in any way to not provide us this information. Very good advice, obviously. Use the Tor browser if you're getting something a little bit sensitive, like a, like an eSIM, and make sure you don't use KYC Bitcoin. Now, I'm just curious, Silent Link, about your model here. I think it'd be a little bit interesting to people to understand how how this works. So, you are, I guess, you're essentially a, a reseller of phone numbers or, or eSIMs, and I guess my question is, who owns all of the phone numbers at the end of the ownership line? Does that make sense? Actually, to build a service like ours, you need to uh, collect different services like eSIM profiles, uh, roaming agreements, uh, roaming service, number pools, provide the necessary communication and combine it all in one package. This is how we do it, basically. If one of those, because each of those is a, a supplier to you, if one of those, and I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, it's it's difficult to do this. If one of those checked your website, they say, "Oh, we don't, we don't like what Silent Link is doing. We're not gonna, we're not gonna sell them whatever roaming service anymore." They could do that, right? Um, have you have you encountered obstacles like that? No, we haven't, but we always have a backup. You also only have, according to your website, you have, it'll say like seventy some. Uh, eSIMs available. So there's like there's a limited amount of these that you're trying to keep in stock. How difficult has it been for you just to organize all this stuff together and and keep it constantly in stock? Is that a is that a huge struggle? Well, it's manageable. As you can see now, we do not have uh, any plans with numbers at the moment, but uh, those will be available about uh, tomorrow. And for context, we're recording this on June eighth, two thousand twenty three. Let's talk for a moment about uh, a big limitation of the Silent Link service, just so that people think this is not silver bullet. You cannot make outgoing calls or outgoing text messages using Silent Link. You can only receive legacy phone calls and legacy text messages. Why is that the case? Well, there were several reasons why we do it this way. Uh, first is uh, it was uh, pretty difficult to source these uh, numbers, phone numbers, uh, without KYC, unless we only needed incoming calls and not out- outgoing. I, c- I cannot explain you why this is the case, but actually it is. A little bit easier to source th- these numbers and these phone services without KYC information this way. Another reason is uh, to discourage our users from being voice fingerprinted from using legacy phone calls and getting voice fingerprinted. 
And the third reason is uh, to avoid spam. Having said that, we are actually will be rolling out new plans where we would try to enable full voice service. It's still not a very good idea to talk over legacy phone calls, but we will try. Maybe it works for some people, for some use cases. We don't know. Our, we, we just want to warn our users that if they want to re retain their anonymity, they probably should not talk over legacy phone calls. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm trying to think of what some of the the problems might be not being able to to make a phone call. I guess if somebody was connecting their phone number to, uh, let's say, a bank account or something, and you needed to call in using that particular phone number to prove your identity or whatever, that would not be possible. But I think there are better VoIP options for people to be attaching that to a particular account. They can do it right now with VoIP service. But we do not provide VoIP service and we are not going to provide VoIP service because we do not want to mix risks in one place. Any VoIP services that you've found work pretty well? None that we could uh, kind of universally recommend to, to people from all over the world. So please do your own research and look for services that accept uh, Bitcoin or Monero or Lightning. You have two types of, of plans. You can get data only plan or you can get a plan that can receive the phone calls and text messages. If we choose the data only plan, are we assigned a phone number? Well, uh, if you are speaking about the uh, no number plan, the older no number plan, you actually are assigned the virtual Polish uh, phone number that actually doesn't work. So it just gets displayed if you request your phone number, but uh, it won't work for receiving messages or calls. If uh, we are speaking about the newer uh, Data Plus, uh, data only plan, probably is some virtual phone phone number involved that is not shown to the user at all. Could you just cover the uh, the prices real quick, what, what people can expect if they're purchasing service with SilentLink? From uh, $2 per gigabyte and up, you should always check the pricing and uh, mind that in the same country, the prices on the different local carriers can differ like uh, up to 50 times. So in some countries, it's a good idea to switch your uh, phone to manual network selection and stay on the uh, carrier that provides uh, good pricing, good rates. Okay, let's, let's talk about this aspect of silent link. So for most people, if they have a silent link eSIM, and they're using in their country, they're immediately going to be roaming because this eSIM is a phone number from a, a, a different country. You, you mentioned Poland for one of them. Well, let's assume that it's coming from, a, from Poland. So when you use Silent Link, you go to the website, you pay for your service, you top it up, and you do have to top it up regularly and keep on top of that because you can't, because you're paying with Monero Bitcoin, you can't auto pay that. So you have to keep an eye on that and make sure it's topped up so you don't lose your phone number. If you're doing that, in your home country, let's say whatever you're in Canada, you're immediately going to be in roaming mode. So what does somebody, let's say they're in Canada, what do they need to do right from the start to make sure that they're using silent link in the best way possible where they're not getting price gouged or anything like that? You mentioned that they sometimes have to, they can pick between the provider. So when they're roaming, they are using a Canadian telecom provider that has an agreement, let's say, with that with that Polish telecom. So they're using Canadian towers for their service, and in some cases, they can choose which which Canadian cell tower that they're connecting to, which telecom company. Could you just kind of explain how that works and what it means for the average person who is living in a different country? What do they have to consider so that they're not paying too much for data or so that they're getting the best service that they can get? Sure. Uh, the eSIM has a strategy to uh, select a uh, local carrier network. It can be the best signal or the uh, lowest price. Usually it's the best signal. Uh, but every mobile phone allows you to restrict, restrict your connection to some local network when you're in roaming, not use others. Or 
switch it to the default mode is uh, automatic selection so if you want if you have this big price difference uh, in your place and uh, the cheaper network provides you with a decent signal then obviously you should use this feature so in the example of the canadian person they buy silent link today they top it up with bitcoin whatever let's say uh, you 20 dollars worth of bitcoin and they just start using their phone, they don't actually have to go in and manually change providers on their phone. They can just use it and connect to whatever is the whatever's the strongest tower. That's going to happen automatically in most cases. Yes, but uh, in any case, you should first check the local uh, carrier prices uh, on our website and uh, act accordingly. Uh, as far as I remember, for Canada, the uh, best rates were provided by Rogers. So how are people able to, so they're, they're essentially topping up their data on the silent link website and they have to return there to do that. How do they know how much data they're using and if they're running out? Well, they uh, should receive a message from the operator when their balance reaches $3 that it's time to top up, but it's not 100% reliable. So they could just manually check their balance once in a while. One of the main benefits I've heard from people using Silent Link is people who travel around the world. It's very difficult for people to, well, for, for us to, to use our phones in, in various different countries. Google Fi in the past has been one option people like, but you're using Google and they have a, a huge KYC process and, and that's not something that I would ever recommend. So for Silent Link, considering it, you have all of these global agreements, global connections, you're roaming by default. And I believe you you offer service uh, in, in, in most countries, if, if I'm not mistaken. Could we use Silent Link, have our eSIM and just travel around the world and not have to worry about phone service in, in most countries, is that a feasible thing? Yes, of course, uh, because uh, like before it became a privacy service, it was a travel service. So it was made for that. Uh, we serve about uh, 150 countries and the list is growing. Check the pricing and coverage on our website. So besides the global roaming, besides the ability to pay for a SIM card without connecting it to our identity, what are some of the other benefits you see of Silent Link? The biggest benefit is that they are using a roaming SIM card, actually, because uh, privacy conscious people and uh, kind of VIP persons, and uh, uh, for a very long time, they were using this uh, hack of using a foreign roaming SIM card in their home country because it provides much more protection to their privacy. So I think this is the most important thing. What is the privacy that people like that are getting from using the foreign SIM card? It's not that trivial to to know your location and to intercept your calls, etc. If you are with the roaming SIM card, first uh, the local carrier doesn't even know your phone number, so it's very difficult for a local adversary. Uh, they need to make some. Uh, calls to you or send text to you if, you if you even have a number and try to intercept intercept these calls and uh, try to make some timing analysis before they even know what IMSI belongs to you. So if they go the normal route of like going to, for example, private detective and trying to leverage their license to get this information from Verizon and here it's just not possible they wouldn't be able to help them so it, it can deter the private detective kind of route but the the telecom company in in the place that you're using it let's go back to the Canada example we're using Rogers Rogers is able to see if you're using regular text messages they see do they see your phone number and that you're sending text messages or, or receiving text messages and phone calls if you're using a Rogers SIM card, they see everything. If you are using a Silent Link SIM card, then uh, they still can read your messages. And I hope you are not using these messages for anything other than service registration. Teal would be able to eavesdrop on your calls. And I hope you are not using legacy calls. 
But first, they do not know who you are out of all these visitors from other countries. Even if they suspect that you use our service in particular, and they are coming for, from probably Polish profile is used in Canada. So they maybe they see our subscribers as visitors from Poland. Still, there are a lot of people. They do not have information to identify which one of them is you. Data only seem the protection is actually much more uh, reliable because you cannot just send a message to it. So if your adversary knows your silent link phone number, they can send a message to you and try to do timing analysis. So th these messages came, came at that time and uh, it arrived to this mobile phone. So probably this mobile phone is connected to this phone number. If it's a data-only SIM, that it's much harder to do something like that. Let's continue this example. If I was in Canada and I purchased a, a local SIM card in Canada in cash, not connecting it to my identity, would I have the same privacy benefits as using a silent link SIM card? Well, uh, again, it depends on your kind of, of on your situation, because if you are like enemy of the state, you should be conscious of the cameras on your way to the uh, shop. Sure. So we have somebody we have somebody buy it for us. Yeah, we have somebody buy it for us. So we've acquired the SIM card with only cash. Are we getting the, the same benefits essentially as if we had purchased with, with Silent Link in that instance? Because we're not attaching it to our identity. That's much simpler, much easier, and you can do it instantly. You do not have to arrange this operation of uh, getting an anonymous uh, SIM from wherever. I don't know. And uh, maybe it's uh, sold today and uh, not sold tomorrow. And uh, Do you say the, the country that your SIM cards, your phone numbers are coming from? And the reason I ask is, if somebody was from that country, presumably they would not be getting the roaming benefits that we've been describing. No, with the no number plan and with the identity plans, uh, they are in roaming even in these countries. Just they are using different profiles. Like uh, in Poland, they come from Israel, and in Israel, they come from Poland. So this is an eSIM service. Not every phone offers eSIM support, so you got to confirm that. You are loaning us a phone number. A lot of people will, let's say somebody wants to use it to for uh, account verification. That becomes a very important phone number because they need that SMS text message to get into their account. Now, you should be doing what I suggest, turn on two-factor authentication whenever you can, make that uh, an app-based or a YubiKey or something. That's a lot better, but some websites still demand an SMS text message verification. So we want to have the ability to have access to that phone number indefinitely so we're not locked out of our account. Are we able to, let's say we decide to switch service one day, are we able to buy that phone number from you or take ownership of that in any particular way? Or We are trying to address this need and hence this uh, identity service that we provide. But as people in Bitcoin like used to say, not your keys, you not your coins. You cannot actually own a mobile phone number. So we do our best to help you keep this number as long as you need but ultimately if the uh, operator like gets bankrupt or or they decide not to do business with you anymore right yes decides not to do business with us anymore or there's some other uh, things going on then it's very possible that you can lose access to your number it's not a panacea no exactly yeah no and i'm not I'm not being judgmental here. I'm just pointing out to people um, some of the some of the things that we have to consider. And there are there are obviously what what I would do is I would be using some kind of VoIP option for 2FA. Obviously, using 2FA in app based form or YubiKey as much as possible for the things that I am reliant on. I have to get into. Michael Blazell talks about having a Google Voice number for those and just using it just for that to, to receive your text message, SMS message, and you can lock down your Google Voice number with the S with a with a YubiKey. So just be conscious of that and, and realize as as Silent Link admin is saying, this is this is not a panacea. Uh, but it does offer some some good benefits. And one of those might be the fact that does using Silent Link hinder our risk of being SIM swapped? 
Yes, definitely. It's pretty obvious for your adversary to perform this SIM swap if you are using local operator. At least it's known how to do these things. There are s uh, several ways how you can do these things. You can either curse some, f uh, some person from this operator, or you can go for some uh, of their partners that are able to process this uh, customer care, for example, in some countries. You can perform an uh, SS7 attack that actually steals uh, the routing uh, of the call just once when you need it. There are other ways. Silent Links makes it just a little bit more difficult because it's not known how to do it. What operator they need to contact with what papers or with how, where the call is originating from and how it's routed to, to your phone. It's just not known. It's not obvious. It's non-standard. Hence, it's harder. Good point. Let's say the Rogers Canada example, somebody wants to SIM swap you. They see your phone number is comes from Rogers. So they give Rogers the, the phone call. They pretend to be you. They say, I've, I lost my SIM card. However, this works. And they can get that. Whereas if you have a silent link phone number, they look up the origin of your phone number. It's a little bit unclear. It's foreign. It's not so It's not so easy for them to, tr to try to pull that off. So that's a nice little benefit. So I was thinking of people who live in countries where you're required to attach your government identification to your phone service. I think Nigeria, South Korea are, are ones that come to mind. Should people in those countries be a little bit cautious about using something like Silent Link? Well, if they want, they still can, but we do not know their circumstances and actually if there are any uh, legal risks attached to this kind of behavior. So. It's up to them. What are some of the uh, the challenges of running a service such as yours? Uh, you know, things like uh, abuse, spam, uh, anything like that that you have to put up with running a service that is so, uh, I guess, privacy focused like yours. No, no, no. We we do not. Uh, we kind of blocked the spam from the very beginning, and uh, maybe we will face it later when we try to allow outbound communication, which we will try. But now that's out of the question, and um, the biggest challenge is uh, user support, definitely, because it's a newer service and it's not very obvious to people how to use it in some cases, and we actually kind of need to put some effort into this. One of the restrictions is that this is an eSIM service. Some people like to get new phones regularly. If they had a physical SIM card, they would just take it out, put it into to the next phone. Not so easy to do that with an eSIM. If somebody was switching to a new phone, would you be able to support them moving to that new phone? Yes, of course. Uh, actually, with newer plans, it's not a problem to uh, move your uh, eSIM to a new phone if you still have the old phone, because you need to remove it from the old phone, then you can reinstall it to the new phone. This is uh, correct for a Data Plus plan. For the older plans, uh, you, you have to contact us and we will help you to move the number. But in about a week, you will be able to do it yourself right from your order page. Just press a button to grab uh, the number and the remaining balance from your older account. And that's it. So you buy a new account without a number, uh, go there, enter your old account details. Actually, it's uh, just a URL link uh, with the key. Press the button and uh, voila, the number is transferred and uh, your unused balance from the older account is transferred to your newer account. So if somebody, let's say somebody like to experiment with phones and they had six different phones with eSIMs over the course of a year, they would be able to very soon using your service, they would be able to do that manually themselves, uh, move it over to the new the new phone, the new phone, six phones in a year, something like that. Yes, they can do it right now through support, uh, but they always need to keep the order links and to provide them because the order link contains a pretty long base64 key that is required to authenticate the request that the account actually belongs to you. This is needed to avoid SIM swap, obviously.
Are there any other services that do what you do that you're aware of? We are always trying to do something that nobody does. Some people talk about SM, SMS for SATs, for example. I don't think this is exactly equivalent. I actually haven't looked into it very much. Are you familiar with that website? Of course, of course. <laughs> Friends and family, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin brothers. Oh, well, we like it at all. We, uh, we use it sometimes to test our own service, to kind of uh, send messages out of bound. Very nice service. Are there any uh, topics that I haven't discussed yet that you think we should bring up? Sure. Resellers want it. We have a process in place for resellers and people are actually uh, making good money by... Most of them are selling Pixel phones with Graphene and install our eSIMs. And uh, actually they sell these privacy phones like hotcakes. I bet they earn more money than us. Speaking of Graphene OS, to use a, an eSIM on Graphene OS, I believe we have to enable Google Play services. Is that right? Actually, you can enable Google services, install a SIM, and reflash your phone with Graphene uh, OS without Google services, and the eSIM will be preserved. But you will not be able to delete it or do anything with it uh, uh, until you install Google services again. So there, there is a workaround for that. Are you aware of the company Efani, E-F-A-N-I? And do you have any thoughts on that service? How would you, how would you compare that service to yours? Because I know some people talk about it. Efani, the, the, the uh, suggested use case is having a phone number for 2FA verification that is uh, like uh, very secure and you will never lose it. I don't know. There are a lot of bold claims on this website, enough for me personally to never use this kind of service. And uh, first and foremost, it's not an anonymous service. You have to uh, do full KYC before you can use the service. So, Would Silent Link work in China? Oh, yes. And uh, it also bypasses the uh, Chinese firewall. So highly recommended. And is that something that could be cracked down on? Because it doesn't sound like something the Chinese government would like. Chinese government is too big and Silent Link is too small. So. But, uh, actually, all the roaming uh, phones in China bypass its firewall. It's not just unique for us. They just uh, Maybe this is the reason why uh, you cannot buy an eSIM-capable phone in China. You need to go abroad to purchase one all the iphones all the pixels that are sold in china are uh, have no eSIM capability your longevity maybe if people like what they've heard so far they might also say well if i get this phone number if i attach it to certain things that will be important i want to keep that moving forward is silent link going to be here six months from now or a year from now or two years when i still need that phone number what would you say to those people well, there are business operates from 2020 and our fiat business is working like maybe 15 years. So I expect us to be here in quite a while. As a final question, we're a privacy focused audience. That's what we've been talking about in the last hour. What are some of your personal phone practices that you use for, for privacy or security that the audience might be interested to think about themselves? Every time I'm invited to any podcast, I am endorsing this uh, project by Stepan Snigirov, uh, who made this uh, wonderful, absolutely wonderful Bitcoin wallet, uh, Spectre DIY. Just look it up. Silent Link Admin, thank you so much for your time. Do you have any final thoughts? Uh, we will be starting a, a discussion group on Matrix on our server, so uh, everyone is invited as soon as we launch it. There we will be able to answer uh, questions in more interactive form. Please join us there. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Gabriel. Well, thank you. I'll, I'll just say a quick final note here to the audience. I've asked a lot of questions that I have about the service. Obviously, with, with any service, you want to make sure that you have your assurances and your trust, but I really do appreciate people who are creating products like Silent Link, which is very useful if you're a global traveler or if you're if you 
want to have some protection against SIM swapping, or of course you just want to get a phone service for Monero or Bitcoin, that's a very useful service. I appreciate them for creating that. You can test it out and see for yourself um, and just kind of not give out any information along the way. So we covered what the risks could potentially be. I think they're very minor. And I very much appreciate Silent Lake more than any of the telecoms providers out there who are gobbling up your data. So thank you for creating something and we'll just have to experiment and people will just have to listen for themselves this episode and see uh, if they trust you enough to uh, use your service. So thank you again.